Issa wanted to give the talk, but she had some good news. One of her friends was getting married, so uh, I'll be speaking on her behalf. And all of the errors in these slides are due to my advisor, Issa, so uh, blame her. <laughs> so let's start with the title here, Threshold BBS Signatures. What is a BBS Signature? Um, <clears throat> It is a scheme designed by O. Susilo and Moo in 2006. Starts like any other uh, basically elliptic curve signature scheme. So for example, it looks like this. Okay, yeah. Has a secret key where X is chosen from ZP, uh, where the public key is basically G to the X with a few other group elements in there. So similar to essentially every other elliptic curve signature algorithm like ED EDDSA, Schnorr, and ECDSA, etc. The magic happens with the signing algorithm, which is different. It looks like this. You don't have to parse it right away, but you do have to understand a few things. The messages are in the exponent of this right here. And the secret key here is like 1 to the X over E, uh, X plus E. OK, and the verification here requires two uh, pairing operations. So it's very costly. This is a signature scheme where it's more costly to verify than it is to sign. And just to give you uh, like a quick three slide snapshot of what's going on in this paper, right? The one difficulty with signing here, especially if you want to distribute the signing across many parties, is this little red bubble right here. One over x plus e, x is the secret here. E is like a nonce for the signing. So the problem becomes how do you invert the secret key in the exponent? Okay, that's the major technical problem with distributing the signing of this type of signature. And our observation is that it has a lot of parallels with the threshold ECDSA scheme, which we've worked on previously, and we found very efficient solutions. You see there's a 1 over k in ECDSA. It's in the base field. It's s. s is in sort of like a, you know, the scalar group, not, not a group element. Here, the exponent uh, 1 over x over e is, is applied to some element a that's part of the signature. Slight difference. But we'll see that that's not a problem. Importantly, why do we care about this BBS plus signature? Um, okay, well, anonymous credentials, that's the answer. And what are anonymous credentials? So you can, I'll give you a few slides since the next talk is also about anonymous credentials. Uh, credentials are like cookies here. So essentially, this one party has like a credential or a cookie that allows them to do something on behalf of Northeastern server, as you can sort of see. Uh, but there's a problem with cookies slash credentials, which is that you can be tracked across the internet. So if you show your credential slash cookie to one party, verifier one, and then you show the same thing to verifier two, then they'll be able to link you across. And in fact, this is the basis for several trillion dollar companies on the internet. So how can you get around that? Uh, well, this anonymous credential allows you to basically get a credential from the issuer and then basically prove to another party using like zero knowledge techniques that you have a credential with certain properties. You could do that with verifier one, then you could do that with verifier two, and in particular then these two parties won't be able to uh, link you, right? So that's one of the nice properties about anonymous credentials. You can also have a credential that has many attributes and you can only show a subset of these. In fact, the next talk is going to talk a lot about uh, this particular thing. So. Again, back to the main question, why do we care about BBS plus? Well, that is because this signing mechanism right here, this signature equation, makes it very easy to produce uh, zero knowledge proofs about certain messages. So it's very efficient to produce like um, Schnorr style proofs that uh, you know some signature that verifies on a particular message vector. Some of those message vectors can be, some of the aspects can, uh, some of the MI can be public, some can be private. You can basically prove things uh, about those messages. And not only is this theoretical, but this, this particular signature scheme is widely deployed in things like EPID, which uh, now has like a billion customers counting if you think about all the processors that Intel has been producing since 2015. And then there's DAA, there's K times anonymous credentials, blacklistable credentials, etc. Etc. Et so that is why BBS is an important signature scheme to consider. It is a legacy signature scheme, and it is used for anonymous credentials. Yeah. And uh, what's the problem so far? Well, <clears throat> the issuer of a credential is a single point of failure. Uh, so what happens if this issuer becomes compromised, right? So um, if, if the issuer becomes compromised, in fact, uh, then then uh, you know then. Credentials can be issued on, uh, you know, sure you can break the soundness of this. So the main topic of this talk, the rest of this, is how to distribute the task of issuing a signature among several signers. In fact, the next talk in this session is going to talk about other security properties. You may want to 
audit, for example, the issuer and make sure, be able to check every single credential that the, uh, the issuer has, has created and so forth, that is, uh, that is part of the next, uh, next talk in this session. So this is what we're trying to do. Distribute the task of issuing this legacy signature, the BBS Plus, among several signers. And you saw the problem, which was the first technical slide. The problem is the secret here lies in the exponent and is inverted. Okay, so what kind of solution do we want uh, for this problem? Uh, this is the desired protocol flow. So we would like a solution to this problem that works like this. The client sends their request to all of the servers, and in fact, without loss of generality, can send it just to one, and the server can then propagate that message, so it looks, it's very easy to implement and so forth. Then the servers exchange a pair of messages. In fact, we'd like a two-round uh, sort of protocol with sort of low latency as a result, and then the servers simply send a response back to the client, and the client is able to reconstruct uh, the signature. And this basically, if you look at the flow of this, it means that you can use this solution, if we were able to basically distribute the signing, you could use it for any drop-in application of, uh, of the BBS Plus signature, for example, in EPID and, and so forth. Note, I'm lying here because there is a protocol for setting all of this up here. All of the parties in that, all of those servers run a setup phase, which uh, is efficient, but I'm not gonna talk about that really in uh, this talk. You can look at the paper for that. So here is the nice thing about uh, essentially our protocol. Uh, it fits on one slide. It's pretty straightforward to implement here. And uh, it's color coded. So the yellow part is a local computation. Uh, essentially the parties sample some values and run this local F0 functionality. It basically creates shares of zero, which can be done uh, without any communication. And then the red and the, the, the salmon and blue uh, things are basically the communication. So you basically commit to some nonces, and then you begin this multiplier protocol. This is basically a way of uh, doing secure multiplication. And each party sends uh, the commit and the multiply, the first mes multiply message to all of the other parties, waits for the response from that round from all of the parties involved, and then basically opens the commitment and finishes the multiply. And it's almost like the freshman dream in security, right? The freshman dream is you can just kind of uh, do these things in an honest but curious way and then magically they'll also be maliciously secure. So that's one of the insights of our protocol is how to make this maliciously secure. And you'll notice here that there's an extra alpha i and an extra beta i. Otherwise the equations just basically work. If you just sit there and plug this into the equations of the thing, it basically works out. Um, so the last message there is the green one. In fact, the last message where all the servers send those values, E, S, R, I, and U, I, to the client. And then the client basically uh, takes all of these and reconstructs this particular value, and then importantly checks if the signature verifies. And if the signature verifies, in fact, it knows that no other party has basically cheated or has acted indistinguishability from uh, basically honestly following the protocol. One important, notice in our, important note in our protocol is that all of these are mostly symmetric operations. So after the setup phase, which does require public key operations, most of those, the COM, the zero, the MUL, all of those are symmetric operations and the only uh, sort of group uh, operations are in that last green box. It's essentially the group operations needed for signing, et cetera. Okay, very good. Uh, this idea is not really that clever. It's based on this very old technique of Barilon and Beaver for inverting. This is a short cartoon, but since I'm running out of time, I see I'm going to sort of skip uh, exactly how this works. But Barilon Beaver basically had this idea of how to do secure inversion. And essentially the idea is you, you basically pad the value that you want to invert with the random nonce, and then you kind of invert both of them in the, in the clear. You, you, you re release x times r, and then you kind of invert that, and then you kind of multiply by r. Now all of a sudden you have additive shares of the inverse. The real contribution of our paper here is the malicious security, right? So this is really the, the novel part of it. The, the protocol is very simple. It's like the freshman dream protocol. It works almost like the honest but curious one, but there's no zero knowledge proofs. There's no cut and choose. There's no fancy expensive things to prove that this works under malicious security. And so how do we achieve that? Uh, we achieve that because essentially we can analyze the cheating to essentially one strategy. The adversary can basically cheat by, whatever they do is basically equivalent to them adding an additive offset to one of those four values in the protocol. 
And then you can just track those down into a case analysis to see when does this break the signature and when does it allow the signature to con basically still work. If it still works and the you know, person has, uh, has cheated, in, uh, had, has put offsets in this, then essentially it's a signature for, uh, forgery. And that's kind of how the security proof basically works. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's kind of the, the idea. The next question is like, well, how fast is it? Uh, and so we did an implementation uh, on this type of hardware here, if you care to look, uh, and we basically tested on a LAN as well as a sort of wide area network. And here are essentially the signing results. In fact, we've improved the protocol a little bit since our camera ready version of this, and so we've gotten this better, but we haven't updated this part of the graph yet. Uh, here are the important things. The signing uh, is basically manageable. It's on the order of seconds as the number of parties grow in the x-axis. And the right side here is basically giving you the, um, essentially how long, how much compute extra overhead does it take. So that, uh, that bottom two yellow, the yellow portion of that bottom graph there gives you how much our protocol runs between two and 32 parties uh, when it's running on a local, on one machine or on a LAN machine. Uh, you know, you can sort of see that, uh, in fact, the LAN machine starts beating the local machine because of the compute, uh, because basically we have more processors at some, at some point. And then the WAN, essentially those WAN uh, break, break, those are the blue points here, essentially they break according to latency. And it's essentially exactly the number of uh, messages needed in our protocol if you look at the latency between West Coast and East Coast and United States and Europe and United States and Asia. Those numbers right there, the ping latencies, essentially explain all of those numbers. The important point is that on the number in practice, we think that this is going to be deployed around two to four uh, number of participants. And in that region, we're looking at, you know, uh, you know, in a local LAN setting, essentially a few milliseconds, and in the WAN setting, like, you know, 100 milliseconds. How much does it compare to just running the signature scheme by itself? Here's a data point. If you just sign with BBS Plus, it takes about 1.5 milliseconds for a single signer to sign. And now you can basically see that the overhead of MPC in this application is like roughly 3x if you're running in a local setting, and roughly like you know 40x if you're running in a WAN setting, mostly due to latency. There is another, there are many options for anonymous credentials. So Coconut and its improvement, RP Coconut, is another version. It's based on these point cheval signatures, and that unfortunately requires this LS, uh, LRSW assumption, which is an interactive assumption. And thus, they only approve sequential security. So there are a number of drawbacks. Uh, there are also a number of advantages to this scheme if you're, you know, uh, but you can sort of see here, the big line, up, the, the line above and the line below, which are blue, those are basically the client and security running times for uh, the RP Coconut scheme. And our, our scheme basically goes right in the middle. Uh, so depending on the application, uh, you know, one can choose one or another. But importantly, this is UC Secure, our scheme, and it's also legacy scheme. So if you want to deploy BBS and you're using it for some other reason, then this is kind of your choice. You can't use the, the scheme uh, Coconut. You can't use the scheme from the next uh, talk as well. Extensions, we can easily extend this to other, uh, you know, this like Tessara Zoo uh, optimization of this BBS Plus. You can do weak and strongly blind signatures, Okamoto signatures, even threshold VRFs, et cetera, et cetera. I want to leave with this one last signing uh, slide. Where does this fit among recent threshold signature schemes? And BBS is sort of like, you know, there's Schnorr, which only requires linear operations, EdDSA, which requires a very complicated red thing right there to produce the nonce if you want to, if you want to basically follow the letter of the law. There's BBS Plus, which requires that difficulty, but only requires one multiplication, and ECDSA, which requires two multiplications uh, based on the state of the art. So that's what I wanted to leave you with. And Thank you for your attention. Thank you for trekking all the way to Sausalito for this talk here, so. Thank you. Any questions? If you have any questions, please go to the mic. Oh, uh, yes, great talk, by the way. Um, if you go to uh, the BBS comparison with RP Coconut, um, the graph, I was just curious, since I noticed that it looks like the, uh, the RP Coconut client is a linear trend, whereas the um, local client might be, or the, uh, your example might be uh, super linear. I was wondering, uh, did you look at um, at what number of parties, for example, it, it like it, does it always stay under that line, or is there uh, some point where um, it becomes more efficient? I think at two. Well, uh, so the problem is the uh, RP Coconut local client has to do a lot of operate the client 
accumulates a lot of information from the servers, right. has to do a lot of pairing operations to put all that stuff together. Mm -hmm. That's where this cost is. And essentially, our client has to do one pairing operation, uh, just to verify the uh, equation. Uh, our servers need to do one pairing operation, too. So basically, that's where the, uh, where the, the savings comes from. OK, I see. I was just, OK, thanks. So I, I know there's a lot of prior work on trying to show that general MPC protocols are maliciously secure by reasoning about uh, adversaries that can only do additive attacks. And I'm just curious how much overlap there is in your analysis and the analyses that apply to the general setting. So that is very good. You could use generic MPC techniques. The, all of the additive, uh, all of the generic results in the additive uh, operation, basically they are theoretical results. They're not sort of practical. The important thing that we've realized here is this: in this inversion protocol, since we only need one inversion, the, the, the pad R that's needed there basically automatically works as a MAC. So there are generic, the best generic MPC techniques for, for arithmetic circuits mm -hmm. basically have double the complexity because they, use, they create extra max. Here we avoid that base, by this observation. That's a very nice result. Yeah. Nice We're job. running out of time, but you're the, uh, last, yes, so the last, last clown in the clown car. So, so you mentioned malicious security. Do you mean like security with the board or like more robust guarantees? No. Uh, in this situation, basically the best we can hope for is security with the board. And is it's that, not even identifiable abort. And is that true for RP Coconut as well? I don't know about that. That's a good question. Uh, I think it's probably true for RP Coconut as well, that you cannot, abort, you cannot do identifiable abort. OK, thank you. Uh, in this setting, you have n minus 1 adversaries. So the best you can hope for is security with abort, by the way. OK. The best you can hope for is identifiable abort, but mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you very much.